Is it you all that are shining or is it the lights in my eyes? <laughs> I think it's both. <laughs> you know, I think Civic Ventures and the Purpose Prize did not create the phenomenon we see here. They saw it coming and realized that in a time of change, you have to have some forms to express that change. You have to have models for people. People have to have ways of talking about what has happened. But I want to start by reminding you, reminding all of us, that we are in the middle of something new in the history of the human species. Now, through most of the history of our species, average life expectancy at birth was under 40 years. People don't always realize that. You know, when I was a kid, um, I think I found a dead bird and had a conversation with my mother about death. And, and I said, well, do people die? And she said, yes. And I said, well, how old are they when they die? And she quoted the 90th Psalm to me, that the years of a man's life are threescore years and 10. Well, let me tell you, when that Psalm was composed, 70 was not an average life expectancy. It was an aspiration. And elders were precious, very precious, and rare. Uh, and we know that the presence of elders in a community is a survival factor for children born into that community. And that this has always been true of our species. Um, to make people aware of the immense significance of increased longevity, Roughly 30 years of average life expectancy in the industrialized world in the last century. I like to remind people of human childhood. You know, consider the other mammals. We're mammals. Most of them are walking within hours of birth. They're ready to reproduce within a year. If they're rabbits, sooner. For some others, it's longer. Consider human childhood. One of the most distinctive characteristics of our species is this long, profoundly dependent childhood. Sounds pretty inefficient, doesn't it? You think evolution would take care of that and speed these kids up? and. The reverse is happening. Childhood is lasting longer, <laughs> not shorter. Right? Why would we evolve this long dependent period? Because it is this long dependent period that makes possible the growth and survival of a species that survives by learning and passing on learning. And all those other mammals that get going faster, they've got a lot of innate programming to get them going. Okay? And it's not just that. The, this long human childhood is when we learn how to love, we learn how to hope, we develop will, Anybody that's ever raised a two-year-old has watched a child developing will. Um, we develop conscience. Things that are absolutely essential to full humanness. And I want to argue today that the development of a period after the reproductive years after a first career of some sort, before old age. It's kind of like a mirror 
to the development of childhood. We should be asking, what does this mean in the evolution of our species? What will we be able to do together? See, here we are now. Something new in history. Who's the we? Where's the here? When's the now? As I was thinking about coming here, I was thinking about the phrase whole earth and Stuart Brand's latest phrase, which is the long now. And on the, on the coffee table out in the hall, uh, advertising recyclable uh, cups and plates was a quotation from René DuBose. Think globally and act locally. Right? We've all been hearing that for years. I like to remind people, you know, 30 years ago, when the environmental movement was just getting going, you know what they said to dismiss it? They said it was just about little old ladies in tennis shoes. They were the only people that cared. So I'm working on being a little old lady in tennis shoes who knows what matters for the future. That's the critical thing. So I listened to the description and read some of it in advance of the Purpose Prize winners, what they'd done. And it seemed to me one of the most interesting things in these descriptions uh, was the frequency of some form of replicability. You have to start your action locally. You have to think globally as you do it. But it's not just a, a one-way street between the two. It's back and forth and back and forth. Because what we do is we start a project, a line of thought, a conversation, try it out around the breakfast table or at the town meeting, uh, and then maybe it can be expanded. Maybe it can spread more widely across the country. <coughs> so the where is the whole earth that we need to be thinking about. There's research that suggests that as, as we get older, we think more longer in time and broader ethically. I think it's, it's a complicated back and forth. You know, as you, when you're a child, your world is very small. Initially, you're in the womb, and then you're in your mom's arms, and you begin to have a sense of what home is, and home is very small, few people, your time sense is short, and maturing and growing is having a larger and larger sense of where you are in your city, in your country, on the planet. There were those wonderful posters around for a while that were pictures of outer space with the Planet Earth is here. Uh, you are here. Um, and in time, of course, one of the things that we all have is a deeper sense of time simply by virtue of having lived for many years through many transitions. I would say something further. Whether you have undertaken a social change project or not at this point in time, everyone in this room has expertise in social change. 
just because there's been so much of it coming in on top of us that we've had to adjust to. We've had a chance to change ourselves, to revise our opinions, to throw out stereotypes and prejudices that are obsolete, rethink, relearn. We've seen some changes we don't like, probably. Maybe we can do something about them. So the we is a whole new phenomenon in human history exploring unknown territory, this second stage of adulthood. And one of the ways to think about how important it is is by thinking about human childhood. Now, human second adulthood may help us reaffirm some things about humanness that need affirming. And while I mention that, I think the conversation between the grandparent generation and children is immensely important. I often say to audiences, if you don't have a child in your life, at least one child in your life, do something about it. <laughs> Find one, all right? And if, and if your kids are taking their time and not producing grandchildren, well, <laughs> find your own. <laughs> I keep wanting to laugh about this coming of age business. You know, my mother wrote a famous book called Coming of Age in Samoa. People have been asking me all my life, did I come of age in Samoa? Um, well, no, I'm actually just growing up now. Um, but the, the, the critical thing is the dialogue between the generations. Um, and because it is that dialogue that becomes a basis for imagining a future. And I think there's a, there, there is a relationship here in the projects you've all been engaged in between addressing needs, problems existing now, helping people who are dealing with poverty or illness or what have you, homelessness, and thinking about the world in which the next generation will live. You need those children in your lives. And both to represent the future and to help you grow up, too. You know, <coughs> human children are born with the capacity to turn stupid, self-centered adults into passable parents. <laughs> They're born educators. <laughs> and parenthetically, because probably all of us have had the experience of wanting to give some good piece of advice to someone a lot younger. <laughs> Ever tried that? <laughs> There's a magic formula. There's a magic formula. Listen first. Ask your niece, nephew, granddaughter, grandson to explain something about the world that he, she lives in. And then make a comment, <laughs> right? Because the critical thing about the relationship between generations is that learning goes in two directions. Any of you that Googled me when you saw me on the program, know that the, the motto, my personal motto on my website is, we are not what we know, but what we are willing to learn. And in the only way, really, in which older adults are going to have 
even a fraction of the respect that they had in historical societies where culture was very stable and change extremely slow. The only way we're going to have something like that respect is if we are committed to learning day by day. The thing we can't do is say, we know better because we're older. And you know, this issue about becoming wise, you know, they say experience is the best teacher. But not if you don't do your homework. And the homework is reflection. It isn't, you know, you don't become wise by having a lot of experiences. You may be traumatized by having a lot of experiences. <laughs> you become wise by reflecting on those experiences, putting them in perspective, comparing them, considering the alternatives that might exist to what happened, uh, things of that sort, avoiding making the same mistakes again and again. Uh, as so often human beings do. So one of the two, I've mentioned ongoing learning as an absolutely essential characteristic of this emerging community that has to be mentioned. And a second element is having the time for reflection, because that's where perspective comes from. Okay? So we got the years, we've got the experience, we've got an extraordinary new level of health, <coughs> we've got a level of security that older adults certainly didn't have in this country when I was growing up. When Michael Harrington wrote The Other America, and when he was describing where is poverty in America. Well, one of the places was among the aging. And we've made a, a lot of progress since then. We have a lot of freedom. Freedom can be scary. Um, but we have to keep looking after the things that keep us active, keep on learning, and find the time for reflection actively reflecting on the past. You know, everybody's life history is a gold mine that most of us have limited access to. When, when, a, when a, a situation comes up and you say, I don't know what to do next, you have to ask, have I ever been in this situation before, what did I do? People talk about, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with people who are refugees or, or immigrating to this country under difficult circumstances. What do you do? How do you, how do you adapt to a new culture? You come in as a stranger. Hey, remember first grade? Remember what it felt like when your parents <laughs> dropped you off at school and there were all these rules you had to learn and all these strange people? We've all been there. We may have been there in kindergarten or preschool, but we've all been there at least once and have that as a resource to draw on. That's why reflecting and life review are so critical. And they're also critical for finding out what we regard as really important to invest this gift of time in. I've been working on life histories for over 50 years. Um, it's, it's one way of doing anthropology. And I've tended to work within the model that was developed by Eric Erickson. And the reason I've worked within that model is because the Eric 
Erickson model is based on and I start, start the sentence differently. So much of psychology starts from problems. It starts from neurosis. How was this child traumatized, damaged, et cetera, in childhood? Eric's approach asks, where do the strengths come from? Where does resilience come from? And, and looks at development starting at birth, in terms of the development of the capacities for will and love, I spoke of those, fidelity, uh, caring, love and caring, uh, generativity, uh, active wisdom is the new strength of this new stage of life. A combination of something that has been essential to human communities throughout evolution combined with energy and mobility. You know, through most of history, pretty much most children might know have known one grandparent. And most people who were lucky enough to have their children survive to reproduce have known maybe one grandchild, right? Now there are children that have seven or eight grandparents, <laughs> right? We've got the biological grands and we've got the great grands. Oh. Didn't used to have many of those. That's why there's no good word for them. Uh, and the honorary grands, and the ex-grands, and the step-grands. <laughs> so, and that's good, because you know what? They're not sitting still. Used to be you might have one grandparent, well, at least that grandma or granddad would sit still. And we're not sitting still. We're on the move. So, Who are we? Something new in history. Where are we? We are, I hope, thinking about the entire planet and thinking about our local communities. And that's possible now. And what's the now? The now is the long now. The now is the now that extends beyond our, beyond our lifetime to future generations. But I was just thinking this morning, you know, two things I want to mention that are global, that I wish you would all carry with you as you focus in on specific projects. One is the United Nations Millennium Goals. The notion was that a series of goals would be achieved uh, within a reasonable time after the beginning of the new millennium, basically to eliminate the worst poverty on the planet. And a lot of nations made commitments and were way behind in moving towards those goals. And I was trying to remember this morning, I think they were supposed to be completed by 1915. Is that right? I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So they were proposed before Y2K, and we've had 10 years during which very little progress has been made on those goals. And we got five years left. Most of us have five years left. We can give this a push. And it needs a push. And not only that, but we are in a time, a critical moment in the history of our planet. The possibility of slowing the process of climate change and global warming is rapidly slipping out of our hands. 
That's something else we'd better get under control in the next five years. Can't leave that for the next generation. They're going to have plenty of problems dealing with the amount of climate change that's already irreversible. Because you know, friends, when people see resources being reduced, one of the things that human beings do is fight. They look at the world as a zero-sum game, and I want my share. So sustainability is not just about protecting this beautiful planet we live on. It's not just about <coughs> dealing with the humanitarian disasters that will be caused by climate change and loss of arable land and crop failures. It's also about, hey, let's be the grown-ups and see if we can prevent the quarreling that's going to develop. It's about preventing the warfare that tends to develop when there are environmental problems. So two global assignments for the next five years <laughs> while you're reforming all your communities and solving those problems. And let me give you another one that I deeply believe in, and I'm going to stop quickly. See, the great irony is we live longer, but we think shorter in our society. Everything is speeded up. People in adulthood, one, are working two shifts. Most of the, almost all the women are working two shifts now. A lot of the men are working two shifts. Uh, information is pouring in. And people are under pressure to make short-term decisions. Short-term decisions are often bad decisions. They're bad for the environment. They're often bad on social justice issues. Little wars that are going to be over with quickly leave wounds and hates that can last for centuries, and they're not even over quickly. OK? So let me, let me say that I think together, I asked, who is the we? Because the Purpose Prize focuses on the actions of individuals. It is together that we are a new phenomenon in history. And maybe together we can develop a voice for longer range thinking in our society. One of the things that makes me most angry about politics today is the politicians think that when you're over 50, all you care about is entitlements. Now, I care about the entitlements. Social Security, Medicare, prescription drug coverage, these are what give us a good part of our longevity and our freedom to use it to give back, to use it in service of society. They're very important, and they're incidentally important to our children. But the notion that anyone over 50 is only caring about their own individual entitlements is not only wrong, it is demeaning. It is as ugly as any other form of ageism. I'm convinced that everyone in this room 
cares about this country, other human beings, the planet, beyond our own lifetime. And that the best way, the best way to focus that care is by having a relation with kids. And the best way to express it is to lean hard on politicians. <laughs> on this specific question, think long term. Defend the effects of what you are proposing 20 years from now. I don't care if I get a, a tax rebate next year. I want to know what this is going to cost 20 years from now. So, as I thought about this, I thought about um, the words of a famous rabbi that's in the Talmud, uh, living in the century before the Common Era, uh, Hillel. You've probably all heard this, but it just seems to express so much um, of what we're saying, I think. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? And when I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Okay. So, we are new and we are many. We are creating something new. Where is global and local? Both all the time. And when is now, immediately, the next five years, and reaching into the future far beyond our lifetimes. Thank you. Dr. Bates, and I think they said it better than I ever could. Thank you so much for an extremely uh, provocative and evocative uh, uh, comments. We appreciate it so much. We're going to be passing again. Uh, staff will be passing through to pick up your questions uh, for Dr. Bateson. Uh, we have a little bit of time to do that. And uh, while we're collecting them, I guess I'll lead off. I was going to say, if I don't get to answer every one of the questions. I'm going to take these index cards home with me. OK, so that's also a chance for me. I hope you ask questions I don't have answers to. Uh, Great. You, to, to start things off, you really talked about um, we're all going to go get a child uh, somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, but in your judgment, when you talk about adulthood too, what is perhaps the single most important thing that we can do to really begin to move this country to this new level of awareness, A, that there is an adulthood too, and that B, that we need to begin making space and, and uh, uh, accounting or been accommodating for this new era that's called adulthood too. How do we do that? Well, you know, there have been a series of movements in the 20th century, starting with the Civil Rights Movement, then the Women's Movement, Gay Liberation, uh, and each of these required a change of consciousness in the people who would become the leaders, the development of models, uh, and they required people getting rid of the stereotypes that they had internalized. Stereotypes get, get internalized. Oppression gets internalized. 
And one of the things that, that I learned for the first time when I was teaching at Spelman was how at the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, the faculties of the historically black colleges and universities discourage students from joining the movement. Why? First, because they could have died. Uh, but second, because it wasn't going to work, right? And there had to be a change of consciousness, an affirmation of the possibility of changing racism in America of working towards justice at every level. And the women's movement, of course, had a name for this. We, they had consciousness-raising groups where women said, you know, I've been told all my life what I'm supposed to want, what a good girl does, that I really want a husband and two children in the suburbs, and you know, I want more, and I can have more. And I think Americans coming up on 50 or 60 are still walking around with stereotypes of aging that are literally inaccurate. People are blindsided by the fact that they're healthy. <laughs> right? Not to mention still alive. So what I've been advocating, among other things, is consciousness-raising groups where people think about what it means, what they want to do when they retire, or if they retire, uh, who they can be in the next 20, 30 years of their lives, and what they most deeply want to be. I heard a wonderful phrase the other day, where, where their deepest passion meets the need of the world. Um, I think we need conversations for that. So gather your friends, go home, all fired up, and invite a whole gang of people over for tea and cake to discuss this. <laughs> I think you're going to have a lot of cards to take home with you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, We'll take this one. Um, in the last election, the largest block of Tea Party voters was over 65. What do you make of that in terms of intergenerational connection? Well, I don't think we should infer from that the stereotypical view <laughs> that everybody over 65 is an extreme reactionary or that everybody over 65 is angry as the Tea Party seems to be. Um, but I think we should notice, and it's very important, that of the different age cohorts, it's people over 50 who vote in the highest percentages. Uh, so I think you're going to find both because of time available uh, and, and because, oh gosh, we you know, those of us that grew up before Watergate still have some ideals about American politics. Um, I think you're going to find older adults involved in any new political movement. Um, and why let the angry ones set the tone? <laughs> <laughs> um, there was one here about your father. I'm trying to find it uh, here. That, let's see if I can paraphrase. They said that uh, this person uh, was, was actually with your father uh, at, is it Green Gulch? Green Gulch, yeah. At Green Gulch. Uh, and uh, apparently his his passing was quite extraordinary. And she wanted, to, or this person wanted to know if you would talk a little bit about conscious death. Mm -hmm. And sure. what does that 
What does that mean? Um, uh, Green Gulch uh, is a, a farm in Marin County uh, that belongs to the San Francisco Zen Center. Uh, when my father, um, well, he, he had lung cancer and he had been, the, the looked at, op opened him up and looked at his lung and said it was inoperable, told his wife that he had a few weeks to live, and he was working on a book. So he called me back from Iran where I was working and said, we've got to finish this book. And we worked for a month on the book during which the cancer went into remission and he got stronger <laughs> and uh, he signed another book contract. <laughs> And two years later, the, the new book wasn't finished and his health was going down again. And he figured that um, the cancer was back. He had this pain in his side and also. Um, and he said, well, I guess this is it. And instead of being in the hospital, he went to stay at Zen Center. Um, and he was quite clear, I don't want any more medical care. I'm going to learn how learn how to let go. And um, and the, the Zen students came and meditated in the room, and he talked to the uh, Roshi, the Buddhist teacher, uh, about dying and letting go. Um, and. His wife and I were there looking after him, and we weren't in the hospital, and everything was very serene and beautiful. Um, I think to me, it was a very great blessing. I think caring for someone in their dying is a privilege. Uh, I think it was a great blessing for him to be able to say, you know, I pulled back from death last time. I've done the work. He asked me, would I please finish the book? I did. I spent a year finishing it. Um, but that sense that we were together as a family, we were all accepting the necessity and reality of death and simply peacefully caring for each other. And I think this is something that's very important for all of us to discuss with our families, to think ahead, to put in the context of our faiths. Um, because, you know, the fact that there are limits, the finality, the fact that we will all die is part of our humanness. And we have to claim that part of our humanness. Um, I once was asked to write an essay for a book with the title Sacred Trust. It was a book about environmentalism. But I kind of deviated from the expected model. And I wrote an essay in which I said, death is a sacred trust. And unless we include death and dying in our understanding of life, life, we're missing something very important. And incidentally, we will never be able to live at peace with the natural world of which we are a part unless we include our own death in that understanding. The fact that, that you walk into a forest and you see these lovely trees, but the sponginess of the ground between your feet has to do with thousands of trees that have died over thousands of years. That the forest is simultaneously a story of vibrant, beautiful life to affirm and a story of the necessity of death within the total pattern of life. Um, so 
I yes, I wrote about that experience with my father. It's in the book called Willing to Learn, because uh, we have to learn from death. And we have to do wonderful things first. <laughs> <laughs> this will be our last question. Um, and you do have a stack of uh, cards to take home with you. It reads, given the Supreme Court decision strengthening corporate personhood and protecting corporate influence in public policy, how can we in this country best challenge this decision and strengthen the idea that we must separate uh, private corporate dollars from public policy? <laughs> okay. For starters, maybe we should challenge the notion that corporations are persons. That individual human rights apply to corporations. It's an old idea. I mean, it's, it goes way back in common law. But through a time period, when the, the difference of power and so on of corporations and, and individuals was not so great. Um, I mean, this, this notion of corporations as persons is very deeply built into our legal system. Um, and so it's hard to fight. But I think it in, in and of itself may be a bad idea. Um, second, I don't think money is speech. Right? right? The, the point about this, 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 this Supreme Court decision is that uh, it permits the unlimited amplification of speech through the use of money and money of, of undetermined origin. Um, we should be looking not, I mean, free speech, absolutely, but the amplification of speech, the guy that drives down the street with a sound truck, with a huge microphone blasting sound into everybody's windows is invading privacy. That's an obvious example. But doesn't that apply to the commercials on TV and the ads that we get exposed to during elections? They're coming into our homes and shouting at us. And we, we can turn them off. We can learn not to listen. But it's amazing how, much, how often we don't take the trouble to shut them off. So I think we, that's one thing to fight. Speaking of wanting to preserve the future, let's preserve, let's work to improve our government. Let's, let's work to improve the conversations about government, the campaigning, the political process. That's part of consciousness raising. If we start conversations about politics, they can begin to spread. Please join me again in thanking Dr. Olson.